Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. I wasn't going to answer the door. I should have ignored it. My sermon is usually put to bed well before Saturday night, but this one particular week, I guess I was a little lazy or I had too much going on on my plate. So I was in my office banging away on my computer when I should have been home in front of the TV watching Hockey Night in Canada. So maybe I was being punished for my sloth. The doorbell rang, I answered. We want to talk about God, they said. Two young men, one dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, the other was dressed in what I can only describe as a long dress-like shirt with matching beige-colored pants and sandals. I thought, wow, the, the fish are jumping right in the boat tonight, I thought to myself. So I invited them to my office, and they sat down, and they got right to the point. What do you believe about God? One of them asked me demandingly. I was taken aback. I stammered a bit. How does one sum up Christianity in a few sentences? Well, we believe that God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again three days later, and that we are joined to Christ's life, death, and resurrection through what we call holy baptism. And because of this, our sins have been forgiven, and God has promised new and everlasting life. A quick answer. A lot left out, but there it is. But they were unimpressed. You also believe in the Holy Spirit? He asked. Well, yes, I replied, we believe that the Holy Spirit is the power of the risen Jesus alive in us and alive in the world. Kind of mentally patted myself on the back for such a succinct answer. But it was clear they weren't buying it. So you believe in three gods, he asked. No, we believe in one God, three persons. Well, what's the difference, he asked, and his voice was rising. Well, think of, no, 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 H2O, this liquid steam and ice, three different expressions of the same substance. Well, this is what I said, knowing how oversimplified my answer was. Then he rose from a chair, yelled with his index finger pointing heavenward and said, there is not three gods, there is only one God, and his name is Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, and the Quran is God's holy revelation to mankind. But, oh, whoa, hey, buddy, you didn't tell me you were Muslim, although I expected as much. You do not have the authority to forgive sins, he blasted at me. You do not need priests to mediate between God and man. Well, what about between God and women, I thought to myself. And who said anything about priests? This is a Lutheran church. Do your homework, buddy, if you're going to come in here and start accusing me of things. You don't need phony rituals like baptism and communion. All you need is to get down on your knees and beg Allah for forgiveness and turn your life towards him. Phony rituals? Baptism and communion? He obviously came with a prepared speech. His sidekick chimed in. He had a softer tone, clearly the good cop to his friend's bad cop. He said, look, we're not trying to convert you. (laughs) Yeah, right. He says, we just want to have a conversation. Really? Well, I said, this conversation is over. And I ushered them to the door. And as they were leaving, the loud one turned to me and said, You've been given Allah's message from not one, but two Muslims. You need to turn your life to the true God now before it's too late. You could die on your way home tonight, and if you don't repent, you will find yourself in damnation. Was that a threat? Please leave, I said, and I shooed them out the door. This happened a few years ago when I was living and serving in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I tell you this story not to beat up on Muslims because I know that these two fellows represented a very small subsect of Islam and most Muslims I've encountered would be appalled by these guys' behavior. But I tell you this story because it showed me just how religion can be abusive and uncaring, an expression of of an ambition to power, the very opposite of what its scriptures teach. And my encounter with these Muslims haunted me and I've tried to pinpoint why it bothered me so much. And I think it was because, despite their warnings, they didn't actually care about me. Ultimately, they didn't care if Kevin George Powell, husband at the time to Rebecca, dad to Sophie Naomi, became a Muslim. I wasn't a person to them. I was an an object. They weren't motivated by love. They were interested in power. They wanted to hammer away at my faith. They were angry with me for not sharing their beliefs. They wanted another convert, another notch on their belts, another conquest. They wanted to be superior. 
And it breaks my heart when I see Christians doing the same thing. Christians who threaten non-Christians with the eternal fires of hell, and they call that good news. Christians who believe that they're arbiters of God's judgment. Churches who adopt a hostile stance towards so-called non-believers. Followers of Jesus who see the world as the enemy rather than a planet beloved by God for which Jesus died and rose again. An example of this was when I was in Lethbridge. There was a church on one of the main drags that had a display on their front lawn that said, Jesus is coming back, whether it's politically correct or not. And when I saw that sign, I thought to myself, why the confrontation? Why pick a fight like that? What was that message supposed to accomplish except to alienate people and make the members feel superior? Is that really what Jesus wants from his followers? And they're not alone. There's a common theme among Christians, types of certain types of Christians, that says that religion generally, and Christianity specifically, is under attack in North America. That North American culture, however that is defined, is launching a concerted effort to wipe Christianity from its consciousness. This often comes up around Christmas time. Because often around Christmas, I hear someone coming up to me and saying, it's a slippery slope from the cashier at Walmart saying, happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas, to the RCMP bursting in here and rounding us up for worshiping Jesus. For this person, not saying Merry Christmas was evidence of the culture's attack on Christianity, and it won't be long before we're all sitting in jail for our beliefs. And when I hear this and I have my inner inner eye roll happening, I saw that from where I sit, this couldn't be further from the truth. Christianity in Canada is being coddled, not attacked. And I really noticed this when I came back from my time in Japan. Because in Japan, Christians make up less than 1% of the population. And Japanese culture and society pay little to no attention to Christianity. And when I came back, My eyes were open to the privileged place Christians have in Canada. I saw it everywhere. Because even though church attendance across the board in Canada is declining, Christian influence is everywhere. North American culture is swimming in Christianity. The best examples of this is that Good Friday and Christmas Day, both specifically Christian observances, are national holidays. No other religion in Canada can say that. Everyone gets a day off on their major feast days. When Yom Kippur rolls around, it's just another day for us except for our Jewish friends. Our Muslim neighbors go to work with rumbling bellies during Ramadan. And Christianity is still being well represented in popular culture. It's alive and living in our cultural consciousness. Christian images are everywhere in music videos. Churches are full at Christmas and Easter. Prayers are said before NASCAR races. And I'm told that there's a Lutheran pastor portrayed on the Mindy Project TV show. To say that Christianity is under attack seems to me to be a lack of cultural maturity. What some see as attack is really declining privilege. We can't depend on the surrounding culture to do our job as Christians anymore, nor should we. We can't assume that the schools will teach religious values, nor should we. We can't assume that prayers will be said in the classroom, nor should we. We can't assume that the society will bend to meet Christian needs and reinforce our beliefs, nor should we. Because I see this happening as being a good thing. After leaning against the culture for so long, our evangelistic muscles have gotten flabby. So it means that we're being forced to be more intentional about our faith. It means that we won't be co-opted into baptizing everything that the culture deems good. It means that we regain a sense of our freedom as we are liberated from institutional chains. We are free once again to tell God's story in our lives rather than telling society's story. We are free to reimagine how to express God's love to those who need healing. We are free to be a dissenting voice in the culture's conversation, a counterpoint to the world's prevailing wisdom. We are free to be a resurrection people, alive to the stirring of God's life-giving power, rather than tending to the machinations of institutional power. We are free to live God's distinct message of mercy. It means that we will think 
more deeply about how we make our faith matter in our lives and in a world God loves. And we will emerge stronger from exercising muscles that have atrophied. The Bible tells us that we are simple messengers, that we've been asked to bring good news where there is bad news, healing where there is pain, comfort where there is grief. We are to announce that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of justice, the kingdom of peace, the kingdom of compassion, the kingdom of life has broken into the world, that God's new creation is blossoming all around us, and that new creation is love. We are asked to love as God loves. Because it's been my experience that when people strike out at Christians, it's because they've been hurt by Christians. When non-Christians lash out at us, it's usually because we demand that they adopt our agenda without first receiving our Savior. When secular people oppose us, it's often because we insist on a privileged position in society rather than taking a rightful God-given place as servants. What people do not need is dogmatic absolutism. Folks aren't swayed by hostile arguments or demands of rigid propositional truth. People need love. They need forgiveness. They need healing. They need a fresh start. And let me say that I know how hard it is to love. I work with people after all. People can be petty, angry, mean, self-absorbed, and self-righteous. But people can also be kind, generous, warm, and compassionate, often in the same person. But Jesus never said it would be easy to love. But that's the challenge, isn't it? In fact, Jesus said that people would know that we are God's people by how much we love, and people will know him by how we love others. And that's the challenge that Meredith has been received into today. She's been received into God's family through the sacrament of holy baptism. She's been given a mandate to love, to tell God's story with her life, to be a healing presence, to show others the love that she has been given today, a love that will be with her every day of her life. And at the end, a love that will lead her into eternity. That's the same love that we've been given, the same love that we give away, Because loving people can be risky. It can hurt. It costs something. Because just ask Jesus. He knows something about the price of love. And he knows that it's worth it. And may this be so among us. Amen.